So this is the fifth lecture in Anthro 202, Human Evolution. In this part of the course, we've been looking at material evidence uh, in the earliest humans. And for this particular lecture, the topic here is thinking about what we call in anthropology archaic humans and modern humans, trying to understand this concept, well, the evidence and data behind it, and how this supports, right, a, a theory of evolution. So up until this point, we've been looking at a, a number of things. We explored some of the present or contemporary evidence for evolution. We looked at the genetic evidence of shared DNA with primates. We looked at shared morphology and behavior with contemporary primates like chimpanzees. And then with the last lecture, we began to explore evidence from the past. So we looked at archeological evidence about 10,000 years before present for the development of agriculture, the development of urban, human urban settlements, and then the kinds of human anatomical changes uh, that we can see right in the archeological record. And sort of we're continuing this now, we're continuing to look at the archeological evidence for early human evolution um, but we're going to add and we're going to go further back in time. So if we go back before the development of agriculture, there is a period known as the Upper Paleolithic or the Upper Stone Age. And so from about the development of agriculture to about 50,000 years ago, we think of this as the Upper uh, Paleolithic. And it is where we have clear evidence for what we would call anatomically modern humans in the archeological record. Before 50,000, then it becomes uh, more difficult to find anatomically modern humans. There's more debates and there's more controversies and the evidence becomes much more complex for whether or not there are human beings on the earth and to what extent the remains and fossils that we do find are either related to us, right, or indirectly in our evolutionary line. And it's really this period of 50,000 years ago to the development of agriculture that we see this expansion of these um, Homo sapiens throughout the world. You get this range expansion during the Upper Paleolithic that's very, very important to understand. 50,000 years ago to the development of agriculture, one of the things that we see is the range expansion of Homo sapiens. So this is clear, clear because if you were to dig in certain areas of the world, um, we can see when Homo sapiens sort of appear there in the archeological record. So it isn't the case that uh, Homo sapiens can be found all throughout the world previous to 50,000 years ago. That, that is not what the evidence or data from the archeological record would support. You really have from 50,000 years, the beginnings of the expansion, right, of Homo sapiens with a population in central Eurasia that is going to uh, move southwards and move into Southeast Asia and Australia. But you also have that population that moves uh, northwards and moves eastwards and moves into Asia and Siberia and crosses the Bering Strait into the Americas around 15,000 years before present. If we're thinking about this period of the Upper Paleolithic, one of the things in the archaeological record that we see is really the increasing complexity of the cultural artifact assemblages, the, the tools, if you will. Uh, we see homo sapiens or human beings beginning to depend upon fishing in this period that wasn't seen for earlier um, periods of prehistory. Uh, we see existence of ritual and some people would argue religion during this period. And we see what is a sexual division of labor. We begin to see evidence in the archeological record that uh, males and female homo sapiens are beginning to do different tasks or roles in their local population or their local uh, group. There's a couple of evolutionary questions to think about once we start talking about the Upper Paleolithic. 
And it's really from before agriculture, and then that number 50,000 years before present, that we begin to really need to turn away from, let's say, looking at uh, changes in Homo sapien populations, but we begin to think about what the origins are of Homo sapiens in that record. And one of the things to introduce here is that Homo sapiens are only one member of a genus, and that in time, there were other Homo species. And once we get beyond that 50,000 mark, we begin to have questions about who, what species made up this early Homo uh, genus. We have questions about what particular um, species are more closely related to us and which species are more distant. And we begin to have that question of speciation. Uh, when we begin to come to the end, right, of evidence or data for uh, the existence of Homo sapiens, but we see other species, other Homo species, we begin to, to raise questions about, well, what were past species that are ancestral to us and which gave us the traits, right, that was the foundation, right, for early forms of Homo sapiens? A lot of these questions are raised once we hit that kind of 50,000 mark. And some of those numbers are kind of rough estimates, rough estimates, if you will. So in the text, it talks about a couple different scenarios of modern uh, human origins. That is the origins of these uh, anatomically modern Homo sapiens that we find in the record and that which end at about 50,000 years. There is a a species, Homo erectus, that we believe to be ancestral to us. Uh, and Homo erectus doesn't sort of just disappear and you have modern Homo sapiens emerge. We have the co coexistence in particular localities, and then we have other closely related uh, Homo species. And so there is questions about the degree to which some of those other species are part of our line and the degrees to which they are, are not. So you can see for the multi-regional continuity um, scenario, right? It isn't this neat linear line where you have uh, Homo erectus uh, developing in Africa and then spreading as Homo erectus throughout the world and Homo erectus in different parts of the world uh, beginning to evolve and through process of natural selection becoming more human-like. And at the same time, speciation occurring, but not to the extent that there's not gene flow through the populations. This is the multi-regional continuity scenario. Um, you see here for the out of Africa, the idea that the Homo erectus lineage that spread throughout the world before the expansion of Homo sapiens isn't related right to the Homo sapiens line. And you get the development of the Homo sapiens line um, in Africa, and then it expands out and replaces those erectus populations without any kind of gene flow two different kinds of, of scenarios. And there are other alternatives um, that sort of integrate these. Um, rather than, let's say, uh, having no gene flow with a population like Homo erectus, the idea is that, no, in fact, there is some gene flow, but maybe not as much as the multi-regional continuity scenario would allow us to believe. So the Upper Paleolithic, but if we keep going then beyond um, 50,000 years before present, we go into what's known as the Middle Stone Age or the Middle Paleolithic. And in the archeological record, this period of time 
uh, can be discerned from about 50,000 years before present to about 300,000 years before present. So again, um, deep, deep time, a time that we're really not familiar with uh, mostly in our lives. Um, it isn't a kind of time frame that uh, we find sort of culturally that many people really reflect upon or, or, or think about. And I think that's one of the challenges to uh, educating about evolution is just this, this time depth that we're, we're talking about, you know, from 50,000 years before present into deep time here to 300,000 years. And during this period of time, uh, we see the emergence of what is sometimes called hunting and gathering. Uh, it is the sort of period when we see big game uh, hunting develop among homo sapien populations. And these homo sapien populations are distinct from us. They are homo sapien populations, but we see differences in their anatomical or their, their morphology as well. So we see homo sapiens in the archeological record, but they are more archaic than they are modern homo sapiens. We find as a kind of the cultural assemblage, we find that they are hunting big game. So here in North um, America, in Siberia, the woolly mammoth was a, a very important resource, very, very large uh, game that homo sapien populations came to depend upon. And after this period, we don't see the same extent of uh, dependence on big game. And when we continue to go in the past and we go deeper into time, we also do, don't see homo sapiens, archaic homo sapiens, depending on big game in this way. Uh, we don't see the same range of tool complexity so the tools that are found during this period of time are sometimes referred to as Mysterian. And I'm going to oversimplify a little bit here so that you can sort of have a big picture in your mind of human evolution and you don't lose that forest picture for some of the trees. So if we're going to be looking at the Middle Paleolithic, we can think about these tools. Uh, we can call them Mysterian. And they are more complex than the tools that we see with the very earliest Homo sapiens. Um, they are more refined tools. Uh, they, they show and they demonstrate learning and they, they, they show a more refined skill and technique in stone tool production. It was in the middle uh, Paleolithic for the first times that we really see art made by humans. We see clear examples of symbols being used in the archaeological record. We see that these are um, archaic Homo sapiens. They bury their dead intentionally, unlike we see with some of the earliest of the um, archaic Homo sapiens. So clearly, the, the range of this um, archaic Homo sapiens is expanding. We are seeing anatomical differences. We are seeing uh, different kinds of subspecies um, in Homo sapiens. We have a, as you will recall from the last lecture, we have a, a situation or scenario in which there is a very small population of Homo sapiens and many of these populations are divided from one another by significant geographical distance. As hominids begin to occupy a broader geographic range, they begin to move into more and more different habitats. The actions of climate change and the climate patterns, such as seasonality, would begin to affect hominids differently in different populations in different parts of the world. We also are talking about an expanse of time, in which there's a lot of cyclical change in terms of Pleistocene climate. Periods that are colder, where we see the development of increasing glaciation in the northern hemisphere, ice ages, and also periods that are warmer, perhaps even as warm as it is today. So there's a lot of geographic and climatic variation throughout Pleistocene human evolution. Now when we think about this, we can also think about what were humans doing within these environments? 
Because while it's possible that natural selection might begin to select for different characteristics in different populations in different parts of the world, given the differing climatic or environmental regimes they experienced, we also need to begin thinking about human behavior. What role does human behavior play in local adaptation to local climatic conditions? This existence, the life of a hunter-gatherer, was what our ancestors were doing for close to at least two million years, from the time they first started butchering animals some two and a half million years ago, up until the development of agriculture only within the last 10,000 years. So it's important to understand what it means to be a hunter-gatherer. Now, in addition to simply foraging all the food from the local environment, there are a number of key attributes to hunter-gatherer populations that we can think about. One of the first is that their population size is small. If you're dependent on the local environment to provide everything you need to survive, your ability to sustain a population is dependent on what technology allows you to get out of that environment. The kind of technology we see in Pleistocene human populations, basic old wand tools, core stones and flakes, eventually more developed tools like Acheleen stone tools, give us a sense of the kind of technological constraints that would have existed on how much food, how much nutrition, essentially, populations could have gotten out of their local environment. So, hunter-gatherer populations would be small because they'd be constrained in terms of the nutrients they could get out of their local environment. In addition to being small, these populations would have likely been fairly dispersed. While the population a local environment can support is fairly small, the geographic area needed to support that population is probably fairly large. Hunter-gatherer populations that exist in contemporary times roam across vast areas, much larger areas than we tend to occupy in our daily lives these days, which suggests that hunter-gatherer populations in the Paleolithic also would have occupied fairly large geographic ranges, covering a substantial amount of ground, not just on a day-to-day -day basis, but season to season or even year to year. So populations would have been small and they would have been dispersed. This gives us an important background with which to understand the kinds of patterns of variation we might expect to see. Populations that were small and dispersed might have been subject to significant amounts of genetic drift. Local extinction, the loss basically of a local population or a set of local populations across a region, may also have been common throughout the Pleistocene. If we think again about this pattern of climatic change affecting small dispersed populations of hunter-gatherers, if there was a significant climatic change within one region, say an ice age affecting parts of southern Europe, or a dry season affecting big areas of southern Africa, that may have led to substantial regional population extinction occurring periodically throughout the Pleistocene. When we think about Pleistocene human evolution then, we need to couple these two factors together. We have populations scattered across a broad geographic range, subject to different local and regional climatic regimes. They would have been highly dependent on these local environments to sustain small dispersed populations of hunter-gatherers. And yet they weren't entirely vulnerable. One of the interesting things about Pleistocene human evolution is that they were cultural organisms. They had an expanding brain. This evidence for encephalization meant they had behavioral capabilities to behaviorally adjust to changes in the environment. So, so in thinking about if we anyway, continue then to go backwards in time, you know, we started from the contemporary moment and we're moving backwards in time, that once you go out of the middle Paleolithic, right, you're you're moving into the geological record um, from 300,000 years before present to about 3 million years before present. Um, and that we would call the Lower Paleolithic, the Lower Stone Age, if you will. And this is the, the, the area of time, the area of the archaeological record that we find the first evidence for archaic Homo sapiens. And this particular archaeological record is only um, available um, in East Africa. So when, once we move beyond that 300,000 uh, mark, we do not find archaic Homo sapiens anywhere in the world but the region of East Africa. So when we say East Africa, we, we tend to talk about places like Egypt, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, these areas, Kenya, and, and so on. So this is the, the period of time which we see the first evidence, and the evidence is very, very little. So when human beings first um, emerge, we're talking about a very small localized population. Very small groups, they are foraging and they are scavenging. So uh, the very earliest ar archaic human beings or homo sapiens 
when we look at the archaeological record, it's clear that they are they're not hunters, that they're exploit, exploiting animals that are dying of natural causes. They are scavenging the kills of other um, pr predatorial species. So we see uh, the kind of cut marks from stone tools appearing on top of um, the tooth marks from other kinds of predators. Uh, we, we find no fixed residences for these, these groups. There's, there's no real encampments um, that we, we find. They are moving from place to place. They are using very coarse or very rough stone tools that really aren't designed so much for like clean cutting. They can be used for cutting, but they appear to be um, like hand axes, things that would be used for, for smashing and so on, rather than things designed to have a very, very um, sharp and, um, you know, fine edge or fine blade. That is not the kind of, of tools that we see. We see very early stone tools worked very simply, but which can be used for cracking open bones, let's say, to get at um, marrow, which we believe was one of the important um, food sources for uh, early archaic Homo sapiens was scavenged uh, bone marrow from, uh, like I said, either the natural death of other organisms, individual organisms, or whether it was uh, those kills from other predators that humans were able to access. So a lot of really interesting evolutionary questions deepen once we you know, get into the lower Paleolithic. So there are different theories as we looked, about, looked at for sort of the beginnings of Homo sapiens, when Homo sapiens um, really don't exist. And there are fossils that we find that we're not sure whether to lump them into Homo erectus, a, a distinct species, but one which many anthropologists would argue is ancestral to us. And you see here a Homo erectus uh, fossilized skull being represented in the, in the image. So there are, you know, splitters or, or lumpers here, people who are going to want to lump them in with Homo sapiens, even though they're archaic features have reached such a stent, extent that there is a, a debate, right? Or the splitters who want to say, no, this, this, the archaic features of this particular fossil illustrate that it's no longer Homo sapiens and that it is uh, a, another species. And it may be distinct enough from Homo erectus to have another kind of species designation. So lots of different interesting taxonomic questions once we get into that lower Paleolithic period and the number of archaic Homo, sap um, Homo sapien fossils decreases dramatically. Uh, we're really unclear here the degree to which Homo erectus is one species or uh, multiple closely related species in the same sense that we're unsure in, in the archaic Homo sapien period this degree of subspecies and the degree of speciation, right, among these populations. I think at this point, though, it's just really important that the more that we go back in deep time, we see this continuum, right, that the species that exist today are not always there in earlier periods of time. We may see related species. We may see uh, species that have some of those traits, but not all of those traits, right? Um, and you, this is where you see that kind of connection that I think that came out in, in the, the period of uh, genetics when we we're talking about genetics, but that you can really see here as well, this kind of biological continuum as you go deeper and deeper into the archaeological record, into geological time. So in, in conclusion here, Fossils and artifacts of early humans clearly reflect heritable change in traits through time. Anatomically modern Homo sapiens, like ourselves, are not found much older than 50,000 years before present. Um, in fact, before 50,000 years before present, we use this term archaic 
Homo sapiens to designate them and to designate the difference of traits that they have. Uh, for example, it's not only more morphological difference or anatomical difference, we also see it in culture. We see it in what was the learned behavior of the Homo sapiens of that time. Uh, probably best illustrated is the change really from scavenging practices to hunting and gathering. And then if you recall back to the last uh, lecture, right, into the domestication of plants and, and animals. And so as we begin to explore that deeper time, we start to, at the kind of dawn or emergence of Homo sapiens, we begin to see a complex variety of different archaic physical forms of Homo sapiens and other closely related species, including the Homo erectus, which most anthropologists would argue is ancestral to us. It becomes difficult to distinguish, right, between some of the very late Homo erectus before it disappears from the archaeological record and the emergence of that archaic Homo sapien population.